Hello everybody and welcome to Charts with Dan. It's a double video morning here on this Tuesday. I also have a review for Ms. Marvel coming up, the first two episodes on Disney+, Plus. so be on the lookout for that here on the channel as well. Before we get started though, I want to thank as always my partners at Carbon Health who are committed to making healthcare as accessible and affordable as possible to as many people as possible. You can download the Carbon Health app to find the nearest location or you can also use the app to do telehealth if you prefer to do your healthcare virtually. Carbon Health also has low-cost COVID antigen tests available at their physical locations if you're on the road and in need of one, or if you just need a couple tests at a reasonable price, you can find the nearest location on the Carbon Health app. Thanks, as always, to Carbon Health for their friendship and their sponsorship and partnership here on the show. Today we are talking about the box office, and even though Top Gun Maverick had a fantastic debut over last Memorial Day weekend, I think that this weekend may have been even better because Tom Cruise goes into the record books, the movie goes into the record books, we have a lot of numbers to break down, and then kind of the opposite of that, Morbius expanded into over a thousand theaters again, and that went about as well as you would expect, so we're going to break down what in the hell they were thinking with that move. Let's look first though at the weekend box office, June 3rd through the 5th, Friday through Sunday, Top Gun Maverick, the number one movie of the weekend, $90 million, week two, and that is not a typo, minus 29% from last week. If you watch this show often, and I hope that you do, this is not the average drop-off for a movie that opens to over $100 million. A lot of times we're saying that like, oh, 45% drop-off, that's really good. Those are strong numbers. 50 to 60% is well within norms, and yet... Minus 29% for Top Gun Maverick. There are so many things to break down about that. Very quickly, running through the rest of the top five, Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness stays in second place in its fifth week with a 43% drop with $9.1 million. The Bob's Burgers movie stays in third place with a 63% drop at $4.6 million. That's a pretty hefty drop for an animated film that may have been a bit front-loaded. The fans of the TV show heading out more for that opening weekend. The Bad Guys in its seventh week actually jumps up one spot to number four with a 24% drop off and $3.3 million. And right behind is Downton Abbey, A New Era, in its third week with a 45% drop off. But let's talk about Top Gun Maverick. This wasn't just a great hold for a movie that opened to $100 plus million. It is the best hold ever for a hundred plus million dollar opener. Let's look at this new record book here. 29% now the best second weekend hold for a hundred plus million dollar opener in history, followed by Shrek 2. Shrek 2 held the record with a 33.2% drop in its second weekend. Frozen 2 in third place with a 34% drop in its second weekend. Sam Raimi's original Spider-Man was in fourth place with a 37.8% drop in weekend 2. And then Star Wars The Force Awakens with a 39.8% drop. So Top Gun Maverick, the only one of these five movies, even in the 20s. And I always talk about the fact that, you know, it's not an apples to apples comparison when it comes to the box office. And what Top Gun Maverick did is actually pretty impressive when you take into context a few other things about its competition. For for example, Shrek 2 opened on a Wednesday, so its quote-unquote opening weekend was actually the third through fifth days of its release. Had it opened on Friday, I doubt that that 33% hold would have been as low because more money would have been jammed into that Friday, Saturday, Sunday opening. Frozen 2, its second weekend was Thanksgiving, a huge holiday movie-going weekend more so, that was the case with Star Wars The Force Awakens. Its second weekend was December 26th through the 28th, arguably the three busiest movie-going days of the year. So they had huge advantages in their second weekends. Actually, Spider-Man was the only movie with a similar release schedule in that it had a second week that was a non-holiday weekend when a lot of people were still in school. The second week of Spider-Man was in mid-May. I think Top Gun Maverick, there were a lot of schools that were getting out this past weekend. The only asterisk that you might put on Top Gun Maverick's performance is that it was a four-day weekend, so perhaps some of that Monday business would have gone to the Sunday box office, and it would have been a little bit steeper of a drop-off. But still, we talked about it last weekend, the fact that this movie is a phenomenon. I mean, the, the, the estimates for a second consecutive week kept growing every single time. It went from like 65 million, oh no, it's gonna do 80 million, then today it ended up doing 90 million. So it's happened twice in a row. People are going nuts for this movie. They have to go see it in theaters. They're rushing out to see it in theaters. Again, the audience is much older than your average summer blockbuster audience. So a lot of people that grew up with that original Tom Cruise movie, and I think it's a combination 
combination of things. Number one, it's a really good movie. Number two, it is one of those movies that the word on the street out there is you have to see this in theaters. A lot of people are watching movies at home nowadays. I think that they successfully marketed this movie and then word of mouth helped for people to say, oh, no, 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 no. You can't watch this at home. You have to see it in a theater. That's the, you know, the the sound, the IMAX picture, everything has really gotten butts in seats. And then I think repeat business is a big part of it too. People going back again. It's kind of tied to the quality of the movie. Mara and I went back to see it this past weekend. We went to see it at a preview night uh, the week that it opened. We went back to see it in IMAX this past weekend. So we were part of both of these opening weekends. People just really like this movie. By the way, you know me and you know I like to crunch numbers. So I I didn't just put together the best holds for 100 plus million dollar openers. I also put together the worst second weekend holds for 100 plus million dollar openers. It's really dominated by one franchise, but the number one movie might surprise you. The 100 plus million dollar opener that dropped the most from its opening weekend to its second weekend was Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part 2. So it comes out, it sets the box office record for the biggest opening weekend of all time. And the next week, it sets the box office record for the biggest drop-off of all time for Weekend 1 to Weekend 2 for a $100 million opening movie. Second was the Twilight Saga New Moon. I've said many times the Twilight Saga was incredibly predictable at the box office. They all opened to about the same number. Most of them grossed about the same number, particularly as we got into the sequels. And their drop-offs were really identical. So 70% for the Twilight Saga New Moon and number two, 69.8% for the Twilight Saga Breaking Dawn Part 1. There at number four in between all this Twilight is Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice at 69.1% in its second weekend. A mighty drop-off that may have push DC and WB away from the Snyderverse and then tied with Batman v Superman was the Twilight Saga Breaking Dawn Part 2 also with a 69.1% drop off. So that's really apropos of nothing. It's just if I'm going to chart the best, I may as well do all my research and give you the worst as well. So those were the movies that did the opposite of what Top Gun Maverick did this past weekend. This also goes into the record book for Tom Cruise. First of all, domestically, in just 10 days, it is now his highest grossing film of all time domestically, and it's not even close. It's going to be his first $300 million grossing film. It may well be his first $400 million grossing film. It takes the top spot over War of the Worlds with $234 million, and then several Mission Impossible sequels. Mission Impossible Fallout at number three with $220.1 million. Mission Impossible 2 with $215.4 million. Mission Impossible Ghost Protocol with $209.3 million. It should be noted for the stats nerds out there, this does not include his cameo role uh, in Austin Powers and Goldmember because it wasn't really marketed as a Tom Cruise movie, so I did not include it on this list. But you know what I like to do? like to adjust for inflation. And as of right now, Top Gun Maverick is not currently one of Tom Cruise's top five domestic grocers, inflation adjusted, but I think it will be soon. Here are the top five right now. Number one is a Top Gun movie, but it's the first one with a $438.2 million gross adjusted for inflation. Number two may surprise some people is Rain Man, the Best Picture winner, co-starring Dustin Hoffman, with $378.8 million adjusted for inflation. Mission Impossible, the first movie at number three with $368.9 million. Mission Impossible 2 with $360 million. And The Firm at number five with $344.6 million. Now, now, if Top Gun Maverick continues on this trajectory, the big thing in its way uh, is Jurassic World Dominion, the, the advanced word, at least from what I've read, not even really a whole lot of buzz on the streets right now about that movie. That could be a good thing. That could be a bad thing. But if that takes a big bite out of Top Gun Maverick's uh, box office gross, it's certainly going to steal a lot of the IMAX screens away from it this upcoming weekend. Then we could see a slowdown. We'll have to look at the, what that percentage drop is from weekend two to weekend three. But if it can sustain any kind of momentum, it should jump into that number two slot in two weeks or less. We'll see. It has a real shot at topping even the first Top Gun movie on Tom Cruise's resume. So, of course, we will keep tracking that number in the weeks ahead. Looking at the box office weekend overall, it was another week that dipped below the 2015 to 2019 average, even though it was well above the number for 2021. You see that big spike that was the debut of A Quiet Place Part 2, as well as, I believe,
Julia Cruella on this weekend uh, last year, kind of a unofficial relaunch of the summer box office. But you look next week, it appears that all we have to do is get over $150 million or so to go above that blue line yet again. Conventional wisdom would say we should have no problem doing that, even if it were just Jurassic World Dominion in the marketplace. But with Top Gun Maverick also in the marketplace, I think that it's almost a no-brainer that we're going to beat that average uh, next weekend. So we should pop up above that blue line for the fourth time in 2022. Looking at the market share for all studios, these are all movie ticket sales year to date. So a total box office of $2.8 billion. I got a note from several people that said that my old pie chart, the 3D one, was a little hard to read. So I went with the more boring, but I guess a little more statistically accurate 2D pie chart. Uh, Paramount picking up another 3% market share. So Top Gun, Sonic, Jackass Forever, Scream, Paramount is having a great year thus far. They have sold 25% of all tickets sold at the domestic box office in 2022. Universal loses one percentage point down to 11%. WB loses one down to 17%. Sony, sorry, it was not Morbin time. We'll talk about that in a minute. Loses one percentage point down to 18%. Disney Fox stays at 18% and all other studios stay at 11%. Before we move on, though, let's talk briefly about Morbius and why the hell it was back in 1,000 plus theaters this weekend. Sony decided to re-release Morbius in over 900 more theaters than last weekend, really attempting to cash in on the craze of the they're not laughing at me, they're laughing with me of social media. In case you don't know, Morbius has turned into a bit of a meme machine uh, because it was so atrocious that it is fun to ironically love the movie and talk about how it is the most successful movie of all time. Well, someone over at Sony had the bright idea that they should, uh, you know, kind of jump in on the fun. And so to celebrate the movie's digital release, Sony decided to re-expand the release so that all those huge Morbius fans could go see the movie once again, right? Wrong. The re-release of Morbius did about $300,000 for the entire weekend for a per theater average right around $300. That equals out to about $100 per theater per day. And if you're assuming that each theater did, let's say, two showings of Morbius every day, that's about five people per show. Morbius had the 35th highest per theater average of the weekend. Some of the movies that beat it out included The Northman, Fantastic Beasts, The Secrets of Dumbledore, and Everything Everywhere All at Once, which opened the week before Morbius and brought in over four times Morbius's per theater gross this past weekend. A lot of people said, well, did Sony really lose a lot of money here because do they pay money for Morbius to go back into theaters? And the consensus that I've read is that they, it really doesn't cost that much because you're not striking actual prints of the film. You're just kind of sending the digital file back to theaters. But keep in mind, at some point, Sony had to go to theaters and say, we'd like to re-expand into your theater. And for some reason, over 1,000 theater owners said yes. And I would imagine some of those theater owners that had those five-person per show showings of Morbius were more than a little bit upset that Sony had sold them on memes to rebook Morbius in their theaters. Because let's be honest, Morbius is a laughing stock. There is very little actual love for Morbius, and there's a whole lot of ironic love for Morbius. If it were ironic money that Morbius was trying to make this weekend, it would be a billion dollar grocer. But ironic money isn't a thing. There's only real money, and Morbius continued to not make much of it. This really should be a stark reminder to Sony that the internet isn't real. The internet is a funhouse reflection of what a limited group of people think that culture is. And sure, those voices may sound very loud, but they're not actually going to go see Morbius again. They're just going to laugh at you because they tricked you into putting it back out there. And while Sony maybe didn't lose money, they definitely lost face this weekend because it was a pretty pathetic gesture. It's kind of like Tommy Wiseau saying that he always meant to make The Room a really bad movie, when in reality, he was just an incredibly incompetent filmmaker and lightning happen to strike and make that movie glorious. Sony, you didn't make Morbius, ironically. You greenlit the movie, you made it, you marketed it for damn near three years, and you turned out a piece of crap. And there's nothing that you can do to polish that turd. Because no matter how much you want to be, you'll never be able to sit at the cool kids' table and pretend that you ironically liked Morbius before it was cool. No, you made Morbius, and you're going to have to live with it. 
All right, let's move on from Morbin time and look at some actually good per theater averages from this past weekend. Top Gun bringing in $18,951 per theater at 4,751 theaters. It already had the widest release for any movie ever last weekend. It added about 20 theaters this weekend. So it actually topped its own record in week two for the widest release ever for a film. In second place, playing in just one theater is the film Poser with $15,250. That's a movie that made its debut last year at the Tribeca Film Festival. The Roundup from South Korea continuing to do well in a small number of theaters, expanding to 22 theaters, still bringing in $4,300 per theater. Neptune Frost, which premiered at last year's Cannes Film Festival, finally hit theaters this weekend, doing $4,264 in just two theaters. And at number five, Mark Rylance in The Phantom of the Open, with $4,263 per theater in six theaters. It was a very close rate for number three, four, and five here. The Fan with the Open is a golf comedy from director Craig Roberts. Looking at the top grocers in limited release, so these are films that were playing in 1,000 theaters or fewer. As we've seen so many times this year already, a film from India at number one in 465 theaters, the film Vikram, making $1.7 million. At number two, Crimes of the Future, which I actually had seen slated uh, in my notes last week that it was only going to be in its LA and New York debut this past weekend. It actually played in 773 theaters and brought in $1.1 million. So that's the latest from David Cronenberg. You might think that the per theater average would be higher for a movie like that, but perhaps the wider release is what tamped that down. In third place was the Sundance film Watcher, which premiered earlier this year in 764 theaters for an $826,000 total. At number four, the documentary Deep in the Heart, a Texas wildlife story playing in 69 theaters in its first week with $126,250. And in fifth place is the fictional romance about the real person Eiffel, the man who designed and built the Eiffel Tower in 308 theaters, bringing in $103,000. Before we continue, I want to take a moment to thank the sponsor for this week's show, ExpressVPN. A lot of folks think they become invisible online by using things like incognito mode, but it's probably not as incognito as you think. Tech companies make a fortune by tracking your information and selling it online, and one of them even said in a recent court filing that, quote, incognito does not mean invisible. So how can you actually make yourself as invisible as possible while online? through ExpressVPN. Every time you connect to ExpressVPN, you get a random IP address shared by many other ExpressVPN customers, which makes it harder for third parties to identify you and harvest your data. Best of all, ExpressVPN is super easy to use no matter what device you're on, phone, laptop, or smart TV. All you have to do is tap one button for instant protection. I didn't actually use a VPN until very recently, and I wasn't fully aware about just how vulnerable and how trackable I was online, but now I use ExpressVPN whether I'm at home or especially when I'm traveling because you never know what kind of unsecured wireless network you're on when you're at an airport or a hotel. ExpressVPN helps take some of that worry off of your shoulders. So if you really want to go incognito and protect your privacy, secure yourself with the number one rated VPN. Visit expressvpn.com slash Merle and get three extra months free. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N.com slash Merle, M-U-R-R-E-L-L, expressvpn.com slash Merle. We are now getting into the deep heart of the summer movie season, and let's look at how it is developing so far. There were no new wide releases this past weekend, so all we see is continued progress pretty much where we were last week. Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness is number one with a $388.6 million gross. It's heading toward $400 million. Top Gun Maverick at number two with $295.6 million. It's steaming toward $300 million. It probably actually passed it today. Downton Abbey, A New Era at number three with $35.8 million, just a little bit of a gap between two and three there. The Bob's Burgers movie at number four with $22.3 million, followed by Firestarter at $8.3 million, Men at $7.1 million, and Family Camp at $3.7 million. So when you look at my predictions for the summer box office and the actual results so far, this is another note that I saw and I actually liked it. So on the left there, you'll see my predictions. On the right, you will see what the actual summer box office is as of today. So you can see that I was right on so far 
with my prediction of Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness as the number one movie of the summer. Top Gun Maverick is now the number two movie of the summer. I had it at number five. And then the other movies that have released this year, I did not include on my picks for the 10 highest grossing summer movies domestically. And while, as you can see, Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness is number one for now, and I picked that movie to be number one, it's looking less and less likely that it will be number one come the end of the year. And that's because of the phenomenal performance of Top Gun Maverick. You'll look here, you'll see the day-by-day -day grosses of both Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness there in blue and Top Gun Maverick in orange. When they both ended their first three days, Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness had a lead of about $61 million on Top Gun Maverick, but you can see those lines getting closer and closer together and eventually converging. And the second phenomenal second week in performance of Top Gun Maverick, as of Sunday, it has now overtaken where Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness was on its 10th day. On day 10, Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness had made $292.6 million. On its 10th day, Top Gun Maverick passed that gross with $295.6 million. So even if Top Gun Maverick were to stop having strong holds and perform exactly as Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness has done for the rest of its theatrical run, it would outgross that film. However, I think that Top Gun Maverick is going to continue to hold well. I think people are still going to show up to see it, and I think that it's going to actually outdo Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness with perhaps uh, some room to spare. So I'm not saying that Top Gun Maverick is going to be the number one movie of the summer because there's a lot of summer left. I am saying that it's looking incredibly unlikely that Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness will be. Let's step outside of the domestic marketplace and see what was going on around the rest of the world. These are the top five films internationally. Top Gun Maverick, another great second weekend outside of the domestic market with $81.7 million. A lot of markets getting a week ahead on Jurassic World Dominion. It made $55.4 million in a select number of markets where it opened before it opens here domestically this weekend. Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness at number three with $11.4 million. The Roundup at number four with $10.6 million and the bad guys at number five with 8.8 .8 million. So when you take those international numbers, you smash them together with our domestic numbers, we get our top five movies worldwide for the previous weekend. And Top Gun had an incredible hold worldwide, another $171.7 million added to its gross. Jurassic World Dominion you see there at number two with its 55.4 million. Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness adds 20.5 million. The bad guys adds 12.2 million. And then the roundup at number five, with 10.6 million. And I talked about the record books. Well, Top Gun Maverick has now started making records for Tom Cruise globally as well, because as of this past weekend, it is now his fifth highest grossing film worldwide. You see there Top Gun Maverick at number five with 557.2 million dollars worldwide. That's about $50 million behind War of the Worlds. A lot of people don't remember how successful that movie was with 606.8 million. And then you see the strength of the later mission Impossible movies on the global stage. Mission Impossible Rogue Nation at 688.8 million. Mission Impossible Ghost Protocol at 694.7 million. Mission Impossible Fallout, Tom Cruise's current highest grossing film worldwide at 787.1 million. And you don't have to do a whole lot of math to see that Top Gun Maverick could very easily overtake Mission Impossible Fallout to become Tom Cruise's number one worldwide movie of all time. I mean, I think that it's got a minimum of $100 million, absolute minimum of $100 million left here domestically. That would mean it just needs another $100 million worldwide, which I think it should get easily. It's yet to open in South Korea, which should be a pretty good market for that film. So I think it's very likely that Top Gun Maverick will become Tom Cruise's highest grossing film worldwide. It's already his highest grossing film domestically, and I think it's got a shot at becoming Coming as highest grossing film domestically, even if you take inflation into account. Uh, so a success all around with Top Gun Maverick. Let's look at the 2022 domestic box office so far. For now, Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness at number one with $388.7 million. At number two, The Batman with $369.3 million. Top Gun Maverick moves up one more spot to number three with $295.6, which bumps Sonic the Hedgehog 2 down to number four. Uncharted remains at number five, followed by The Lost City, Fantastic Beasts, The Secrets of Dumbledore. Again, not looking likely to cross $100 million domestically. The Bad Guys at number eight, $87.2 million. Scream at number nine and Morbius still morbid along there at number 10. Depending on how Jurassic World Dominion opens this upcoming weekend, this could be Morbius's last week 
in the 2022 domestic top 10. When we look at the domestic box office as far as the calendar grows, so this is ticket sales from January 1st onward. Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness and The Batman remain number one and two, but Top Gun Maverick jumps up two spots. It has now sold more tickets in 2022 than Spider-Man No Way Home did. A big chunk of its business was done in the later days of 2021. Sonic the Hedgehog 2 drops down one spot to number five. Uncharted is at six, followed by The Lost City and Fantastic Beasts. The Bad Guys moves up one spot, which moves Sing 2 down to number 10 with $86.3 million. When we look at the 2022 worldwide box office, Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness is still around and it has now crossed $900 million worldwide. Again, very tough to make the case that this is not a hit film. It is now $90 million away from joining that $1 billion club. I don't really know if it's going to get there, but it's sure making a good run at it. The Batman is at number two with $770 million, followed by the Battle at Lake Changjin 2 at number three with $626.5 million. But Top Gun Maverick is moving fast. It jumped up four spots from last week, now at number four with $557.2 million. Uncharted has passed that $400 million mark, but it gets bumped down to number five. Fantastic Beasts, The Secrets of Dumbledore is right behind Uncharted at number six. Too Cool to Kill drops down one spot at number seven. Sonic the Hedgehog drops down one spot at number eight. The Bad Guys moves up one spot to become the number nine highest grossing film worldwide of the year. And Nice View from China drops down to number 10. When we look at the worldwide box office for the previous 365 days, so you take today's date, you roll it back one year, these are the top 10 movies. Not a whole lot of change to the chart, but I did make some adjustments to how things are counted. Spider-Man No Way Home is still number one with $1.9 billion, followed by The Battle at Lake Changjin at number two with $913 million, both 2021 films. Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness is now at number three with $910.3 million, so very close to bypassing The Battle at Lake Changjin. No Time to Die is at number four. The Batman is right behind at number five. And you may notice that that number has changed a little. That's because I changed a little bit how I'm counting the 365 days. Now, it would not affect, I don't believe, any of the movies that are in the 365-day Hall of Fame. But instead of counting it as 365 days from its initial release, I'm counting it as 365 days from the day it enters this chart. So it has to stay on this chart for 365 365 consecutive days. And one of the reasons I did this is because there are movies like Eternals that have been on and off the chart as things have kind of graduated off the list. And it wouldn't really be fair for it to, let's say, for some reason, did stick around uh, for 365 days from the date of its release. It wasn't on this chart for 365 days. So I changed the count just a little bit to take that into account. The Battle at Lake Chung Jin 2 is at number six. Venom Let There Be Carnage is at number seven. Top Gun Maverick, we're counting this as day one because it enters the chart with 557.2 million. That bumps Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings down one spot to number nine. Sing 2 drops down one spot to number 10. And the longest reigning movie now on this chart with the departure of F9 last weekend is Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings having been in release for 273 days. So about 92 more days and we'll have another entrant into the 365 day Hall of Fame. Although at number nine with the bulk of the summer movie season still to come, it's kind of iffy about whether Shang-Chi is going to make it. Before we look at what people are watching on various streaming services, I always like to do a flashback to a weekend in box office past, and we are going back 30 years, believe it or not, to May 29th through the 31st, 1992. That was the 22nd weekend of the year. Those dates do shift around as the years pass. At number one was Lethal Weapon 3, starring Mel Gibson, Danny Glover, and Joe Pesci, with a $15.4 million box office performance. Again, not its opening weekend, so a lot of people checking out Lethal Weapon 3. Opening behind it in its first weekend was the hit Whoopi Goldberg film Sister Act with $11.8 million. In its second week and third place was Alien 3 with $8.3 million. And this just goes to show you the longevity that he's had. In its second week at number four was Tom Cruise starring with his then wife Nicole Kidman and Ron Howard's Far and Away with $7.5 million. So you go back in time 30 years, Tom Cruise still in the box office top 10. And then at number five, a career defining performance really for Polly Shore, Brendan Fraser, any number of people. 
Encino Man in its second week, $6.4 million. I don't think that you can really say that you've experienced the 90s until you've seen Encino Man. And let's say one other Polly Shore movie. Just one. Before we go, let's see what people were watching at home through various streaming services and devices. And we'll start, first of all, with the top 10 movies on iTunes. Top Gun is in the number one spot. People really wanting to relive that first movie. It is the most purchased and or rented movie on iTunes, or at least it was when this chart was constructed. At number two is The Lost City, currently available for purchase. At number three, Uncharted. At number four, Fantastic Beasts, The Secrets of Dumbledore, still only open for purchase and premium video on demand. Also available for purchase and premium video on demand, making its debut on the chart is the film Last Seen Alive. Top Gun Maverick pre-orders are so strong that that is the number six movie on the iTunes chart, followed by Spider-Man No Way Home. Sonic the Hedgehog 2 is at number eight, available for purchase. At number nine, a new addition to the chart, Father Stu, starring Mark Wahlberg, available for purchase. And The Bad Guys at number 10, also available for purchase. I said I was looking forward to breaking down the numbers for Stranger Things 4, and they finally came in. We have about a week delay when it comes to Netflix, but the opening weekend numbers, this is really all that this chart encompasses, we're in for Stranger Things 4, and we can see that with 286,790,000 hours watched, obviously Stranger Things 4 was the most watched program on Netflix from May 23rd to 29th. This covers the Friday, Saturday, and Sunday of the show's debut. A potential finished view number of 31.2, meaning that 31.2 million Netflix users potentially, based on hours watched and the length of the season, could have potentially finished the entire season just in that first weekend. This is not saying that's what did happen, but it's a way to put these hours watch numbers into context and kind of put movies and TV shows on the same footing. At number two was the Netflix movie A Perfect Pairing, having a big jump from last week with a PFV of 19.2, followed by Senior Year with a PFV of 13.1, Jackass 4.5, the only non-Netflix entry on this list with a PFV of 12.4, F Love 2, I can't actually say the name of the title or I'm going to get demonetized, with a PFE of 10.2 is at number 5 with 15.6 million hours watched. The Netflix movie Toscana is at number 6. The Lincoln Lawyer Season 1 is at number 7. Love, Death, and Robots Volume 3. This is an example where you have to take into account the length of the program because not a lot of that season or volume has been released. You see only 15.3 million hours watched, and yet it's at number 8 because a lot of people watch the shorter program that's why we do the pfv number to kind of put everything on a more even keel pfv of 7.2 dangerous actually identical hours watched with a pfv of 7.1 and then the netflix series who killed sarah season three at number 10 with a pfv of 6.9 but there's something that i noticed with netflix which is that i talk about these high numbers week to week as they go on but then i never really track them again so i decided to put together a list of the most watched 2022 netflix programs so i basically took all of the data that Netflix has put out for shows released in 2022 and movies as well. And I tried to figure out what movies and TV shows have the highest PFV, meaning what Netflix movies and shows have the highest number of potential finished views. Now, I will say that there are some holdovers that are not on this list. For example, Don't Look Up had a massive number of views in calendar year 2022. However, it debuted in 2021, so it's not included on this list. These are only movies and TV shows that debuted on the streaming service this year and number one easily is the Adam Project starring Ryan Reynolds, the Netflix original movie with 260.6 million hours watched because it is a movie with that kind of watch time, a PFV of 147.2. That means that 147.2 million Netflix users potentially could have watched The Adam Project in its entirety. Keep in mind that Netflix in their first quarter reported that they had about 220 million users. So that's 147 million out of 220 million that could have potentially watched The Adam Project. I'm not saying the number's that high. Obviously, there could be repeat viewings, but this does show that The Adam Project was incredibly in demand and something that a lot of Netflix viewers took the time to stop and watch. 
At number two is Bridgerton season two with a PFE of 91.1, so 91.1 million potential finished views for the entire second season of Bridgerton. The Netflix movie The Tender Swindler right behind at 90.6, followed by Ozark season four, that number's still rising with a PFE of 79.3. Senior year has been a stealthy hit for Netflix and that I don't think that that was really hyped too much going in, but that has a PFV of 76, 76 million Netflix users worldwide based on watch time could have watched senior year in its entirety. 365 days, this day is at number six with a PFV of 66.1. The Netflix original series Inventing Anna at number seven with a PFV of 65.1. The Netflix movie Through My Window at number eight with a PFV of 58.6. All of Us Are Dead, Season 1, 54.3 million potential finished views for users of Netflix around the world. So another hit Korean show, although not quite as big a hit as Squid Game. I will go back and do the numbers for all of the hours. I just didn't quite have time. But Squid Game would be by far the most watched program on Netflix as long as they've been reporting these hours watch data numbers, which aren't very long, but still, Squid Game was incredibly popular. And then at number 10, The Weekend Away, a Netflix movie with a PFV of 52.6. I would imagine that Stranger Things 4, especially because this next week should have a pretty high PFV number and a lot of hours watched. And then you add on the fact that they have two more episodes that are also both feature length episodes. Stranger Things 4 is going to be on this list at some point of the top 10 and most watched programs in 2022. And like I said, when I have the time, I'll sit down and crunch the numbers so we can go back at least to last year when they began releasing this information consistently and keep an all-time list. So these are the kind of fun things that I waste hours of my time and life doing. I, you know, I wouldn't say waste, actually. In a weird, perverted, twisted way, I actually like doing that. And this show's kind of an excuse for me to just sit around and dick around with numbers for hours at a time. So really, I should be thanking you. Let's look at the top 10 most watched streaming movies. This is according to Nielsen. These are some newer numbers here on the show. A couple of caveats. This is for May 2nd through the 8th, so there's about a one-month delay on these numbers. This is in the U.S. only. This is two-plus minutes watched of each of these programs, and there are certain streaming services that do not participate in this survey, including HBO Max, Peacock, and others like that. This is mainly Netflix, Disney+, Plus, Amazon, etc. That being said, let's look at the top 10 most streamed movies, and Encanto remains entrenched at the top on Disney+, Plus with 7.4. This movie just keeps going, but you also notice this is May 2nd through May 8th, which means this is when a lot of new movies rotate onto the streaming services, and you see that reflected with Netflix. At number two is U.S. Marshals, the sequel to The Fugitive, with 5.9 million hours watched. That displaces Turning Red on Disney+, Plus, which has been number two for several weeks now. The Gentleman on Netflix is a new entry to the chart with about 5 million hours watched. Rambo Last Blood, new to the chart, with 3.7 million hours watched. Kung Fu Panda 3 remains on the chart with 3.5 million hours watched. And then Forrest Gump, the previous record holder for Tom Cruise, War of the Worlds, and Den of Thieves, all new entries to Netflix at number 789. And finishing out at number 10 is Moana on Disney+. Plus. So the same three movies really on Disney+, Plus, generating so much of their movie watch time, Encanto, Turning Red, and Moana. Massive hits for people to watch and more than likely re-watch on that streaming service. Looking at the 10 most streamed shows, again, this is for May 2nd through May 8th. Ozark on Netflix was in the midst of wrapping up its four season run with 55.4 million hours watched in the US. Grace and Frankie on Netflix is at number two. Moon Knight, again, the only one of these shows without a full season available when this data was collected at number three with 11.9 million hours watched, followed by Coco Melon on Netflix with 11.6 million hours. Criminal Minds on Netflix with 8.7 million hours. Heartland on Netflix with 8.5 million hours, NCIS on Netflix with 8.3 million hours, then the Amazon show Outer Range with just over 7 million hours, Grey's Anatomy on Netflix returning to the chart with 6.4 million, and then Better Call Saul dropping down to number 10 with 6.3 million. And that wraps us up for today. The big movie stomping into theaters this weekend is Jurassic World Dominion, and I actually did a stop down uh, in production to transfer some footage while I was doing this episode, uh, the little magic that goes on behind the scenes. Uh, and I guess the embargo dropped for Jurassic World Dominion, and early word does not look 
fantastic, but you never know. So we will see what the reviews are like, what the box office is like here on the show next week. We'll also see how Top Gun Maverick continues to hold up against this competition. Will Jurassic World Dominion be another heavy hitter for the summer movie box office title? A lot of things are going to be coming into focus next week on the show. Thank you so much for watching. If you want to see what else I'm up to, you can check me out on Patreon at patreon.com slash Dan Merle. Like I mentioned, I also have a Ms. Marvel review coming out today here on the channel, so be sure to check that out. And be sure to stick around for all the latest movie news, reviews, box office, you name it. I love putting this stuff together. And thank you for your feedback. As you can tell, I incorporate it into the show uh, when and where I feel that it's necessary. Thanks to ExpressVPN for sponsoring the show. Thanks, as always, to my partners at Carbon Health. But most of all, thank you for watching. Until next time, stay safe, and I'll see you then.